when you look closely, there are amazing animals out there that we don't usually think of. So fiddler crabs have claws that are as heavy as all the rest of the body weight of a male. So these males are doubling their body weight in the investment in these weapons that they wave and that they use in these fights with rival males. And there are shrimp with crazy forelegs. There are flies that live in the New Guinean tropics that have antlers coming off of their heads that are huge relative to the sizes of these flies. We see weapons in wasps, we see weapons in some bees, we see weapons in bamboo bugs, and all kinds of crazy species. And for many years, my research has focused on the development and evolution of weapons in animals. And in particular, the animals that we study are little tiny beetles, dung beetles and rhinoceros beetles with horns. And these horns are rigid skeletal outgrowths that stick out from the heads or the, the rest of the bodies of these animals. And they can be huge relative to the sizes of these beetles. Sometimes these horns are 30% of the body weight of a male or longer than the rest of the male's body. So that's analogous to you or me carrying a 50 pound bag of dog food on our head. And so we're interested in why animals have such extraordinary weapons and what it is about these species that that sort of sets the stage for the evolution of these big weapons. As I was working on this book, I was working with a number of very talented editors who were giving me feedback on the process. And my editors kept sort of nagging me saying, you need to look at human weapons too. We think there's something parallel with human weapons too. And I, I would step back and say, no, I'm, I'm a biologist. I work on beetles. I'm not qualified to be writing a book on arms races or cold war or missiles. And they kept, nagging me saying, you need, we, we really think you need to look at the human weapons too. And finally, I just gave in and I sat down one morning. I remember sitting down in a library and starting to pour through the military literature. And at first it was just on a lark. I was just going to look into it so that I could tell them that I tried. But the more I looked, the more amazed I became when I realized that there really are arms. I mean, I knew everybody knows there are arms races in our military past, but I hadn't realized quite what these things were and what it was about the circumstances under which these types of processes unfolded. It turns out that there's a whole literature out there of people that have looked at military history and asked exactly the same questions that I was asking as a biologist. Why do we get huge weapons or uncontrolled weapon growth sometimes and not others. And what is it about the politics or the, the, the circumstances or the economies of the countries that are involved that set the stage for an arms race? Extreme weapons are extreme weapons and it really didn't matter if I was talking about a beetle or an elk or a battleship. In these types of ancient warfare battles where the combat is one-on-one -on -one and hand-to-hand, -hand, the fighting strength of the individual soldiers makes a huge difference. If you've got a bigger, better trained soldier or a soldier with better shields and better armor and better weapons, they're much more likely to win the one-on-one -on -one encounters with the other opponent on the other side. The essence of the difference between ancient and modern warfare was this one-on-one -on -one fights or duels. If you fight one-on-one, -on -one, the better armed soldier wins. That can mean training, it can mean skill, it can mean size, it can mean weapons, including the bigger, better weapons. The best example I can give is tunnels, burrows. There are lots of examples, the beetles that I work on, the, the males will fight, the, guard the entrance to a burrow, a male will plant himself at the top of a burrow, the females down below in the burrow, and that male's fighting to block rival males from getting into the burrow. Well, according to behavioral ecology, that's a localized and defendable resource, it works. But a tube, a burrow is a tube that also aligns male contests so that you can't get a scramble. You can't have the equivalent of gunfire with 10 different males all charging at once. There's no way. Only one male can fit into the burrow at a time. And he's got to enter head first. So you have a front on head to head encounter between males one on one. So duels are important for human weapons too. And for reasons that are exactly analogous to what we see in animals. And so for example, in the ancient Mediterranean, when galleys had shuttled troops from place to place, They'd been used to transport people to the fields of battle, but the ships weren't actually used as weapons in and of themselves. Ships stayed essentially the same size, same dimensions for literally thousands of years. Then somebody comes along and invents a battering ram, so this cast bronze protrusion that sticks out from the front of the boat. And all of a sudden, because of that new technology, 
the behavior of these ships changes. Now you can actually strike another ship and sink it. So boats become units or weapons in their own right in addition to just vessels of transport. And because you gotta hit the other ship, the fights are necessarily one-on-one -on -one and close range. They're duels. And so from the invention of the battering ram on, ship sizes exploded. The logic that I'm talking about in terms of animals of one-on-one -on -one duels applies to arms races and military technology for exactly the same reasons. I've come a long way from beetles in tropical forests. I've spent many years trucking around in the mud looking for tiny little dung beetles trying to understand the mystery of their weapons. And here I am now in a position I never dreamed of, having looked at all these other animal species and now having looked at all these examples of military technology and finding pattern and parallel after parallel. It's been a very exciting, unexpected ride. And I have to say it's been a bit of a terrifying ride. So if we're gonna take our lessons from beetles and crabs, then the message that they send about where we are today is pretty terrifying because the things that are the deadliest weapons out there today, they could be biological weapons of mass destruction, they could be nuclear warheads that are nowhere near as expensive and nowhere near as state of the art as they used to be. These kinds of weapons in the hands of all sorts of different organizations, terrorist groups, nation states, ends up with a political landscape that's not a duel. It's not predictable. Deterrence isn't likely to work the way that it did in the past and the way that it does in animals. And when you get to that political reality, it's really hard to know what to make of it.